So, brothers and sisters, for this week's Thursday thought, I'm going to take a break from talking about my testimony of various prophets and apostles of the Restoration, and I want to address a concern that has been brought to my attention, and that is this idea of actually organizing a non-denominational church. I want to start off by reading Doctrines of the Saints 50A, and this is a revelation that was given to Christine and I back when we were both the co-presidents in on June 3rd of 2020. And basically, this revelation was on the Council of 50, and what is a Council of 50, and I'm not going to go into great detail on that topic, but I just want to read this one verse here, verse 6. It says that one of the purposes of the Council of 50 is to assist in the works of of the Lord as the saints and those that would call themselves saints move from the creed of the church to the kingdom of God where all that desire shall find a home and a place to dwell to find rest for their souls if you go to the church website.org I we I I say we because this is really something that a committee of us worked on but i'm the one that built the website we have a new website and that is the church website.org and if you look at it it is affiliated and connected very much with the fellowship didn't pull it up so i'm gonna do that right now And you'll notice on the site, it, it is very much a non-denominational church. It says, a community for worshiping God and loving all. Join a welcoming, safe space where you can grow your relationship with God in a community that values diversity. And then it has the five points of fellowship, prayer, scripture, open hearts, unity in spirit, and renewal. And then down at the bottom of the page, every week when we post our service, our Sabbath service, each Sunday... I will be putting it up on the website, so it will sit there for a week, and then you can click on a link to see all the past ones on YouTube. The About page is a little bit different because of the fact that it's talking about this body of Christ. And I know it's a little bit confusing, because, and there's a link also back to the Fellowship website. I know it's going to be a bit confusing because we keep talking about this idea of moving away from the church and towards the kingdom. There's two things I want to explain. Number one is that from my perspective, still today, even right now, the church is you. You are the church. I am the church. And then as we meet together, the church grows. Because the church can't exist without people. And so what this is, if you want to call it a church, it is a home for the spiritually homeless. And it is a creedless church. If you go to the fellowship website, and you click on our beliefs. Actually, I'm sorry. Let's go to Doctrine and Theology. You go to the Doctrine and Theology page. We teach what is known as the Doctrine of Christ. And the Doctrine of Christ is very, cl very clearly given in Doctrines of the Saints, the Bible, the Book of Mormon. I'm going to read the two verses that are here from Mark 115, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe in the gospel. And then in 3rd Nephi, that'd be 532 through 35 REV, 1131 through 34 OPV, and, and I'm, I've abbreviated this. Behold, verily, verily, I say unto you, I will declare unto you my doctrine. Repent and believe in me. Me, of course, being Jesus Christ. And if we look at the revelations in the book of remembrance, and I apologize, I'm going to be skipping around a bit. The revelation that we received on the fellowship itself. The question was asked of, of the Lord, and I'm pretty sure I've gone over this in other videos, I'm going to go over it again. Is the Fellowship of Christ a church, a religious movement, an idea, or something else altogether? That starts in verse 2. 
In verse 3, the Lord says, Behold, O man, the will of your God, the church of Jesus Christ and Christian fellowship is all of these and more, for it is the very kingdom of God. We're not trying to build a traditional church. We're trying to build a non-denominational church. The idea here is a couple of things. One is we are in a transitionary period. So do we have creeds? No, we don't. We have the fundamental truths, which are very simple. There are seven of them. God is real. God is good. We were created to be saved. We have the freedom of choice, free agency. We believe that we should love and serve God. And we do this by loving and serving our neighbors. And then finally, as we change our perception, reality itself changes. Th these aren't something that, these aren't anything that you have to fight anybody over. Because the reality is that if you believe that God is real, then we're in agreement. And if you don't, then that's fine. We have no reason to argue or discuss anything. Believe as you will. We believe that God is good. Why would we worship God if we thought he was evil? That wouldn't make sense. God didn't send us here to punish us. This is the universal message. We were created to be saved. Now, if you believe that we were created to be damned, you're welcome to believe that because we're a non-denominational church. This is our fundamental principle, and you can agree with it or not. Freedom of choice. No one's going to force you to believe anything in this movement. No one's going to force you to believe anything in the kingdom of God. Our goal is to love and serve God, and we do this by loving our neighbors, by caring for the creation. And as we do this, we grow in the grace of Jesus Christ, and our perception changes. And as we do, our understanding and view of reality changes. That, that is just how things are. Anyone that's had any sort of growth, when they look back, they see things differently than they used to. So these aren't really controversial. There are certain points that people can discuss and debate over, but at the end of the day, because we're a non-denominational movement, there, there's really no argument here. When it comes to our Constitution, we have this group, there, there are 14 articles of faith in our Constitution, and all of them are very open to interpretation. The first four of the basic doctrines of what I say movements are an understanding of God. We believe that there is a God the Father and Mother, and you can believe that as Separate beings, the same being, it doesn't matter. The Son and the Holy Ghost, again, separate beings, the same being, it doesn't matter. We don't push a theology on you. We believe that men and women will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam or Eve's transgressions. We don't believe in original sin because we're universalists. If you want to believe in universal sin, you're welcome to. There's scriptures about it in the Book of Mormon, the idea that the grace of Jesus Christ protects us from that, and, and we endorse those scriptures. And if you, but again, if you believe in original sin, you are welcome to do so because we're a non denominational movement. We believe that through the atonement of Jesus Christ, everyone can be saved. We can't save ourselves. It has to come through the atonement, through the grace of Jesus Christ. And we believe that as we're saved, that mercy and that grace, as we grow in it, it leads us to obey the laws of principles and obtain the ordinance of the gospel. There is no commandment. There's nothing in our creeds that forces people to get baptized, receive temple endowments, or anything like that. You do what you feel moved by the Holy Spirit to do. That's how it works in a kingdom. This isn't a chain people down and force them to do what we believe. This isn't also isn't an organization where we try to force people or convince people to believe what we believe. And then these first principles are, Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, God is real. You can't do anything if you don't believe in Jesus Christ. Once we understand the reality of God, then we make a choice to be born again. And because of that, we choose to repent of our sins. That's the second principle. Then, as moved by the Spirit, we may obtain baptism by immersion, the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands, and the Lord's Supper, which we offer once a week in our Sabbath services. Then, 5 through 6, 5 and 6, those are the basic tenets of the organization, how we're organized. 7 through 9, beliefs and sources of revelations and gifts of the Spirit, key universal scriptures that can be found in the entire Latter-day Saint movement and the belief and understanding of continuing revelation within our movement. 
10 and 13 are common beliefs on the gathering of Israel, the resurrection of the dead, ethics for personal and religious personal and religious freedom, and proper conduct within organized and peaceful societies. And then number 14, finally, is the beliefs in the proper conduct of us as Latter-day Saints. Now, one thing I want to read you is, is Article of Faith number 12. We believe that all men and women are born free and equal. Thus, we claim the privilege of worshiping Almighty God according to the dictates of our own conscience, unmolested, and allow all men and women the same privilege. Let them worship whom, how, where, or what they may. Now, combine that with the 14th Article of Faith. We believe in being true, honest, chaste, temperate, benevolent, virtuous, and upright, and doing good to all mankind. Indeed, we may say that we follow the admonition of Paul. We believe all things. We hope all things. We have endured many things and hope to endure, hope to be able to endure all things. Everything virtuous, lovely, praiseworthy, and a good report, we seek after these things. This is a very universalist message. We don't have a creed because we're moving away from the creeds of men. Those, that's When we talk about moving away from the churches, we're talking about moving away from these creeds, these ideas that we have to force people into conformity and not allowing spiritual growth. And then finally, we have our bylaws, which explain legally and theocratically, organizationally, the purpose of the organization. And the, por and the purpose is to establish a Christian fellowship, not a traditional church with a creed, but a Christian fellowship with a school of the prophets, education, with missionary, literature, educational, and all the resources it may deem useful to propagate and practice the full gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and for its service to the community, to earnestly seek and promote the unity of the saints in the scriptural manner of godly love, respect, and faithful voluntary cooperation with liberty. To that end, it shall associate and cooperate freely with churches and with church organizations. And we are currently, right now, working to join various organizations. We are trying, once again, to build this ecumenical movement, inviting people of other churches to come and see. And that's the thing. The spiritually homeless, they don't need an ecumenical movement. They need the kingdom. They need the body of Christ where they can worship with their fellow saints. Those that belong to churches already, that believe in universalism, that believe in the understanding of the Restoration as a movement and not merely as the board from Star Trek where we're supposed to just go out and assimilate everyone. The ecumenical movement is for these brothers and sisters. And we've invited people who aren't even members of the Latter-day Saint movement to work with us. That is the love of Jesus Christ. And I know that there are some that say, well, when you look at what Christians have done to us in the past, by Christians they generally mean Protestants, look at all the anti-Mormon literature, and I've read anti-Mormon literature by both Catholics and Protestants. You know, we, we don't need to do this. But what, is, what does Jesus teach us in the fifth chapter of Matthew? And if you've seen any of my videos before, I'm sure you've heard me say this before. That perfection is nothing more than loving our enemies. Because if we can love our enemies, we're obviously going to love everybody else. So, of course, they're welcome. And that brings me to the next point. One of the reasons why we need a church body of Christ, where we have this, the churchwebsite.org, why we're doing these type of services, is because globally the rise of fascism is just increasing. What is fascism? It's in America, white Christian nationalism, this idea that white makes right, this idea that we have to force Christian values on fellow citizens. This goes completely against the teachings of the Book of Mormon. Read King Benjamin's address. There you will find the, the, the model of the kingdom of God, where everyone is allowed to worship freely, and we are encouraged to do good for others, to care for others. With the understanding that when we serve our fellow man, we are only serving our fellow men and women. We're only serving the Lord, our God. 
fascism would have us believe that God loves a particular country or a particular group of countries more than another. That he loves a particular political party, a group of political parties, or politicians more than another. That God is sending political will, politicians out to, to fix things. That we need to control women, that we need to control minorities, that we need to lock out those seeking asylum, seeking help. When we look at our political world, we have to ask ourselves, are the people that we're voting for, are the people that are representing us, truly representing our message as Christians? Love God. Love our neighbor. Care for the planet. Because if our politicians are focused on helping corporations make money, they're not working for us, and they definitely aren't working for God. And I'm not saying that to pick on any particular political party, because in the United States, the two main parties are both corporatists. They, they both are fully on board with helping the rich get richer and keeping the poor poor. One is just more open about it than the other. But with this rise of fascism all over the world, this idea of locking people out, not helping our neighbors, oppressing people as much as possible just to squeeze a couple extra pennies onto a bottom line to make fiscal reports look good. This is why we need to be building Zion. And it's also why Zion has to be built here in our hearts first. This idea of putting politics over Christianity, this idea of putting political parties over the kingdom of God, it's destroying not only the Latter-day Saint movement, it's destroying Christianity in general. I've read a lot of studies of People that are leaving churches, doesn't matter which one, just in general, churches in general, because these churches are preaching man-made human politics instead of biblical truths. Nowhere in the Ten Commandments does it say anything about oppressing anyone for any reason. Nowhere in the Beatitudes does it talk anywhere about putting money above others or oppressing anyone for any reason. Everything is about taking care of others. Every single law in the Ten Commandments is about loving your neighbor. And if you don't believe me, tell me which one you think isn't, and I'll do a special video just on that. Every single point in the Beatitudes is pointing us to loving our neighbor. And again, if you believe that that's not correct, let me know which one you think isn't about loving your neighbor and I will tell you why I believe that it is. Not to force you to believe as I do. Not to get you to accept some creed. But because I genuinely believe this and I have reason behind it. And I'm willing to share my reason and you're welcome to believe whatever you want. You're welcome to agree or disagree with me. And I want to make sure you know that if you are a fascist, you're still welcome here in this fellowship of Christ. You're still worship, you're still welcome to be a part of the church of Jesus Christ. We accept everyone. And it's easy for me to say because once fascists come on board and they say, "Oh, whoa, you accept these people?" Oof, no, I can't do that. "Oh, whoa, you accept this?" Oh, I can't. Wait, you're not going to force people to to conform to this? Oh, I can't be a part of that. That's why it's so easy to welcome fascists to the fellowship. Because they will always flee from loving their neighbors. Fascism is the exact opposite of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the idea that one group of people is better than everybody else. That one group of people is deserving or more deserving than everyone else. If we can't love our fascist brothers and sisters, then how can we love anyone else? Remember, Jesus taught us to love our enemies. I don't see the fascists as our enemies. I see them as a group of people who are uneducated. And when I say that, I mean they're unenlightened to the things of God. I, I'm not trying to say that in an insulting, worldly way. They have been educated and taught that their views are right and that they're being oppressed, that they're being kept down. By not being allowed to oppress other people, they themselves are being oppressed. They've also been taught that oppression actually helps people. I, I've talked to people who genuinely believe that slavery was a good thing for blacks. 
That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. Slavery is never good for anybody. I've heard people tell me that they believe that a true free government will allow people to become slaves, to pay debts, because that's the right thing to do. That's ridiculous. According to the Bible, we're supposed to forgive debts every seven years. If we were truly a Christian nation, we would be celebrating Jubilee every seven years, and all mortgages would be gone. All credit card debt would be gone. All debts would just be eliminated because that's what the Bible teaches us to do. But capitalism, fascism, these worldly things that are all about getting gain, they're never going to be about loving our neighbors. They're never going to be about caring for the poor. They're only going to be about catering to the rich. And so we, as a people, as Latter-day Saints, as Mormons, as Christians, we need Regardless if we belong to one of those groups I just mentioned, two of them, or three of them, or all three of them, we need to build the kingdom of God in ourselves so that we can build it in the real world. If we try to build Zion, I've had several people call me, come and talk to me, and they say, David, you're a prophet. Is it time to build Zion? How do we build Zion? And I'm going to tell you right now, until we can wipe the commercialism from ourselves, the greed from ourselves, the egoism from ourselves, we can't build Zion. We must build it in our hearts first. We must be Zion to build Zion. Otherwise, we're just going to build yet another church, yet another city, country, state, whatever you want to call it. I will tell you, I genuinely believe that the reason why the Lord wants us to build a temple so badly, why he keeps pushing this idea, is because once we build a temple, we will have an example. We will have an orchard or orchards. We will have community garden or gardens. We will have a building, a structure where anyone can meet where we will help the poor, we'll give them food, we'll teach them how to grow crops, how to preserve food. I don't like using the word self-sufficient because I think self-sufficiency is very close to self-righteousness. So I'm going to say we're, we want to teach people to be more efficient. Because that efficiency allows us to help one another. Imagine living in a community where someone who's really, really good with bees makes all the honey. Someone who's really, really good at growing crops is growing crops. Someone who's really, really good at hunting is out hunting. This is the way it used to be. I'm not saying it's the way it has to be now. I'm not saying this is the way we need to move to. But imagine a group of people that whatever it is they're doing they're not doing it because they want to get cash for it. They're doing it because they love their community. I feel like at the beginning of the Cold War, that's where we kind of were as a country. I think we were kind of moving in that direction. And I think Satan used fear and capitalism and communism to drive a wedge in that community spirit. So my question for you today is my Thursday thought and I want to leave you with is how can we restore that? You want to make America great again? Then we have to make, we have to not make, we have to facilitate change that encourages people in kindness to love one another because you can't make people love one another. So I want to invite you to come and join, be a part of the kingdom of God. I'm not asking you to leave your church if you belong to a church. I'm not asking you to join a church if you don't belong to a church. What I am letting you know is we're here. And we're here for you. And our goal is to be whatever it is you need us to be within logical reason. 
I've had a lot of people over the years. When I say years, it hasn't been that long, but since we stopped doing the the monthly services for the for the new moons and new months, I've had a lot of people ask, when are we going to get those back? I would love to return to those. As soon as we have the people to offer the services, we'll offer them. So I invite you, come and see. Come and participate. Come and facilitate. Come and be a part of the kingdom of God. That's my invitation to you. And I'll leave it with you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.